So, very good afternoon to everyone. We'll move on to the last session of the AOS midterm. May I request Dr. D. Ramamurthy, Dr. Mal Fernandez, Dr. B. Ramesh, and Dr. Ambarish Darek to come on the dais. So, I am uh, Dr. Rohit Dureja, working as a coordinator faculty at LVVI Vizac. I will be moderating this session. So, please, chairperson, co chairperson, convener, please come on the dais. Hi, sir. So before I start the session, just want to confirm uh, how many speakers we have, because the many have the flights to catch. Our first speaker is Dr. Advait Sain. Okay. Second speaker is Dr. B. Ramesh Babu. Yeah. Second. Okay. Dr. Anusha. Dr. Anusha Ajwani. Okay. Third is not there. Dr. D. Ramamurthy. Okay. Dr. Madhav Rao. Dr. Srini is there. Dr. Cyrus Mehta. Okay. Dr. Pragya Panda. Okay, so we have one. Dr. Madhav Rao. Not there. Ek paper there. because and dr srini has a flight to catch so i can i uh, take permission from the chairpersons that he can come first and catch a flight <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah sir please dr srini <laughs> please sir so he will be talking on post refractive surgery il power calculation over to you sir Thank you for uh, letting me go first. Uh, see, uh, I'll, I'll start with the story of uh, uh, my patient uh, Sarita Nair, who underwent uh, LASIK several years ago for uh, adapter myopia and posted for cataract surgery. See, we carefully gathered together all the history of information needed and measured the central corneal power using a topographer. The measured and historical data lined up, and we were confident that our estimation of central corneal power is as accurate as possible used the SRK by T formula and calculated the IL power. Axial length was obtained using the optical parameter. Absolutely no issues with the surgery, IOL in the back. But on the first postoperative week, she had a refractive error of two diopters. So we went back, recalculated everything, uh, confirmed the axial length, and still arrived at the same IOL power. So what happened? So the flattened central cornea not only renders the keratometry inaccurate, but also causes problems with uh, many IOL power calculations, which have been our friends for long. So the third generation uh, two variable formulas, such as SRK by T, assume that the anterior and posterior segments of the eye are mostly proportional, and use a combination of axial length and uh, keratometric corneal power to estimate the postoperative location of the intraocular lens or the effective lens position. If the central corneal power is low, as we uh, see uh, uh, following uh, refractive surgery, the formula assumes that the anterior chamber is shallow. So why is ELP important? In a two lens system, uh, such as uh, the IV half the cornea and lens there, the power of intraocular lens can be thought of something as a relative figure. For example, you have calculated 21 diopter powers. So if it is in the back, so it is in metropia. If it is 0.5 millimeter posteriorly displaced, the effective power is 20 diopters. If it moves forward, it is 22 diopters. So, with a low central corneal power, the formula makes the assumption that IOL that is placed following cataract surgery is ending up sitting closer to the cornea than normal and calls for a lesser power. So, that is what happened here. So, the, the flatter the cornea, the bigger the problem. So, in what position the IOL calculation 
thinks that the lens will sit inside the eye can have a profound effect on the eye hole power that it recommends. So unless a correction is made for the situation, the centrally flattened corneas will have formulas incorrectly assume a falsely shallow postoperative effective lens position. So the end result is that if you don't make any, any correction, these formulas following refractive surgery will recommend an IOL power which is lesser than what is actually required. So what do we do? So you can uh, use the uh, double K correction method which is not uh, uh, done now but just for the completion and just to see the thought process, I'll just uh, mention it and oh, you go for the newer generation IOL formulas. In double K correction method, what is done is use the pre-refractive K value for the ELP and the post-refractive K value for the IOL power calculation. So th this is the table. So you go through uh, each uh, row here. So for Sarita Nair, it was eight diopters. Okay, now the axial length was 22. So if the IOL power that was given was 12, we should have put a 15 diopter. So and uh, for uh, hyperopic, you uh, 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 reduce it. So there are uh, different algorithms and different formula for uh, uh, this, this tricky situation. But what is mostly followed is to go to the ASCRS website and uh, uh, use the uh, calculation, free calculation available there. So coming back to some, some more theories, you can have biometry errors and ELP estimation errors. So the conventional keratometers measure the anterior surface with a refractive index of 1.3375. So extrapolation to the posterior surface with a fixed good strand ratio 1.13. Post LASIK, the good strand ratio is reduced with an overestimation of keratometric power. And post LASIK in, in the central zone, there's a wide uh, range of uh, curvature. So when the measurement is done at 3.2 millimeter, it might miss the central flat, uh, uh, flat zone, overestimate the IOL power and hyperopic shift. So what do we do to overcome these problems? Go for a, a total K for uh, a calculation that you get for uh, optical uh, biometer like uh, IOL master 700 or use a pentacam. It has, a, it gives a, uh, so this is uh, uh, optical biometer. So if it is a pentacam, it has got a, a holiday EK output. And when you go for that, it gives the equivalent. So that can be used for IOL power calculation. So the newer generation formula uh, include holiday 2, Barrett 2K, uh, universal 2, extra. So when you ask uh, the surgeons, uh, prolific surgeons who are doing a lot of uh, uh, cataract surgeries, post uh, refractive surgery, Many actually use the TK from IOL master or uh, Pentacam and uh, do the uh, IOL power calculation and they are getting pretty accurate results. So, and all these studies have shown that it works. The other way which majority uses is to go for the online calculators. Among these online calculators, as I said, the ASCRS is the one that is uh, commonly used. So this is it. So in that, you go to the uh, uh, this site, uh, click on this, and uh, it asks you uh, to enter the data, everything, K, uh, axial length, AC depth, everything, and gives the IOL power that is required. So if, if the, see, I, I uh, prefer monofocals in these cases, but if the patient is really insistent on multifocals, uh, then you have to be even more certain that the power calculation is okay. So. This FAK refraction is a great way to confirm the IOL power. So what we do is uh, the refraction is done immediately after cataract uh, surgery. The, uh, the cornea has to be wet. Visco has to be totally removed. AC formed with the BSS, but, but not very tight that it becomes uh, 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 the cornea bulges up. And do the refraction. And uh, the FAK correction is multiplied by a factor of 1.8. And uh, uh, after the IOL uh, implantation also, you can actually reconfirm the uh, IOL power. So which IOL, so as I said, uh, prefer monofocals, but if it is a multifocal that is uh, chosen, uh, uh, if the cornea is regular and uh, there are no uh, higher order aberrations, uh, the first choice I, I would give is the enhanced monofocals like uh, uh, iHands. Uh, for multifocals, uh, I go for EDOF uh, like Vivity. 
So you avoid uh, these in higher amounts of induced aberrations, descender aberrations, astigmatism more than uh, 0.5, dry eye. Yes, if, if it is a hydrophobic eye, all, I would prefer to go for uh, 0.5 diopters uh, over correction. So, uh, because if there is any surprise, uh, it is better, uh, it's easier to correct. So to conclude, it's, it's an evolving field with a lot of uh, recent uh, developments. Uh, we have almost reached the accuracy that we reach, uh, uh, achieve with the virgin eyes. Uh, the, 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 the expectations have to be set at an appropriate level. You under-promise and over-deliver. Always plan for managing post-surgical IOL surprises. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Srini. Dr. Mari, you have, want to ask any question? So uh, when you look at the ACRS online calculator, it gives you a range, minimum to maximum. Uh, so which value so do you go with? That's what, uh, that's what I said. If, if it is uh, uh, hydrophobic, I always just one, mostly uh, you should uh, go for uh, point 0.5. Because often our experience has been that even if you take a point 0.5, you still land up with a slight hyperopic shift. Yeah. So sometimes you tend to go a little more myopic, even with the minimum value there. We tend to go a little more minus, so we go with um, minus 0.75, you know. Have you found? Works for, works for you. Okay, fine. Thank you, sir. Oh, yes, I was using that earlier, but now I've completely shifted on to the Barrett-Suter formula. So obviously, you know, when you give the EACRS formula, gives you two or three options, as Dr. Merl pointed out. You don't know which one is right. It's more of a, a toss-up. But uh, the Barrett Toric calculator, I find the Barrett two K works very well, and uh, at least yeah, that's, what, yeah, yeah. that's what. I said. I'm sorry, I came in late, so I don't know what was this question. Yeah, thank you, sir. Next, <coughs> I invite Dr. Adwat Sai. He will be talking on ICL, the guide for beginners. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, OAS, for this uh, invitation for faculty talk. So my talk is on uh, ICL Guide for Beginners. I have uh, simplified the talk as much as I could. So from audience, if they have any question, any doubt for the panel, they can ask by the time they do the settings. Uh, what do you feel about the use of uh, EDOPS and multifocals post-refractive uh, surgery? So multifocals, I think it's a little dicey because uh, uh, we have, you know, uh, difficulty in predicting the outcome per se. And so therefore, unless you're sure that you can give them that vision that they want, I think multifocals are a no-no. EDOFs, probably we may be able to offer EDOFs to some of these patients. But then again, you have different scenarios. If you have a post LASIK, uh, probably EDOFs may be given. But RK, I think even that is a little dangerous. They have a lot of higher order aberrations, a lot of irregular astigmatism. They have RK incisions which are extending into the optic zone, which is maybe less than three millimeters. So then the quality of vision is very poor in those patients. So I would be very wary of giving them an, a premium IOL for a post RK patient. Ramurthy, what is your uh, reflective surprise after post LASIK with the ACRS and with the Barrett's? Oh, just to answer the question I asked, I mean, we also thought of this uh, earlier in the sense that uh, you have a multifocal cornea post refractive surgery and pu putting in a multifocal intraocular lens is counterintuitive and would cause a considerable drop in contrast. But nowadays we are going ahead and doing that, keeping certain things in mind in the sense that in case the you see a sea of green on topography where the cornea seems to be regularly flattened. The procedure has been done by a more recent uh, 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 flying spot laser and a small refractive error of minus three, minus four has been corrected. Most importantly, the patient has been having good quality vision post-refractive surgery and only with the onset of cataract, the vision gone down. 
on a higher order abrasions are not uh, too much, which you can get your, with your eye trace or even with a good topographer. We have put in initially some mid-offs and off some trifocals also. With, of course, you, and uh, with reason formula, you are also able to get excellent uh, calculation of the intraocular lens power. So these patients are satisfied, though we do uh, counsel them about dysphotopsy as well as uh, about inaccurate power calculation. Basic patients, I think the, yeah, our case. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. So uh, my topic is ICL uh, Guide for Beginners. Uh, I have no financial interest. So uh, we're going to be talking about the fakic lenses, uh, the ICL or the implantable collamer lenses. Basically, ICL is uh, the lens that is implanted in the eye. Uh, it is positioned behind the uh, iris and in front of the lens. It is used to correct your refractive error like your myopia, hypropia, or your astigmatism. Uh, these are the types of fake lenses that are commercially available. We have the ICL from the Star Company, which is the most commonly used. We have the ICRIL fake from Biotech. We have the uh, RIL from the Upper Somi and the IPCL from the Care Group. So why ICL? Now ICL is basically made of collamer, which is basically collagen and copolymer. Uh, it is biocompatible. Basically, it gives you a quiet post-operative eye. It is uh, USFD approved. It has a high water content, which is extremely safe to the ocular tissues. The refractive index is close to the aqueous, which basically minimizes the internal reflection, and it also minimizes the higher order abrasions. So what exactly is a collamer? Collamer basically is derived from two words, that is the uh, collagen and copolymer. Now, the, because of this uh, collamer, it is, because it is biocompatible, uh, post-operatively, it gives you a very quiet eye. So the workup uh, for the ICL is just like any other refractive surgery. You have to do a thorough uh, systemic examination and ocular history. Uh, please ask for the patient for any contact lens wear and make sure the patient discontinues at least two weeks prior to your examination. Do a thorough manifest and a cyclopedic refraction. Anterior segment evaluation should be thorough on your slit lamp and emphasize on the anterior chamber and the angles. Look for any signs of inflammation. Uh, look for the pupil size. Don't just do the anterior segment evaluation and send it to the retina consultant. At least initial stages, see your patient back. Make sure the pupil is well dilated. Uh, because mid-dilated pupil, you might have uh, difficulty in tucking in the haptics initially. Do a thorough peripheral fundus examination where if there's any peripheral lesions, make sure that barrage laser or treatment is done before at least two weeks prior to your ICL surgery. So the measurements are very critical uh, for the ICL surgery. The AC depth is very important. Now the AC depth has to be measured from the endothelium. Some topographies basically give the measurements from the epithelium. So make sure that uh, the uh, measurement is from the endothelium. Uh, look for the central corneal thickness, the horizontal white to white, which I'll be covering in the next few slides. The corneal K values, the axial length, endothelial cell density, and the IOP. Eligibility is like, again, your uh, LVC, any laser vision corrections. The criteria should be more than 21 years of age. Uh, patients should have a stable refraction for at least one year. The AC depth should be more than 2.8 millimeters in case of myopia and more than 3 millimeters in hyperopia. The angle should be wide and a good endothelial cell count and a normal IOP. Indications for your ICL patient, uh, high myopia, thin cornea, patients who are unfit for laser refractive procedures like PRK, LASIK or SMILE, uh, any ectatic disorders like keratoconus, uh, dry eye disease as ICL do not induce any dry eyes, uh, RST less than 400 microns, of course this is subjective. In my practice, uh, I take if the post-refractive surgery, if the residual stromal thickness with epithelium is falling below 400, I consider ICL. Contraindications, uh, any endothelial dystrophies, ocular hypertension, glaucoma, cataract, narrow angles, if the patient is pregnant or breastfeeding, uh, one-eyed patients or any inflammatory conditions. So the measuring the white-to-white -white is the most uh, crucial part uh, when you're uh, doing your ICL surgery. So white-to-white uh, -white can be measured uh, through your distal caliper, which is the most accurate. Of course, using a distal caliper, you can uh, do it under slit lamp examination or your uh, microscope. Uh, uh, the white-to-white -white can also be measured through your uh, topography or your IOL master. In my practice, what I normally do is I measure the white-to-white uh, -white through the IOL Master 700. I do it with the uh, Pentacam and I also do my digital caliper. I compare it and then I send it to the company and then they give the lenses. So the white-to-white -white measurement is very important. Uh, Post-operatively, we need to look for the vault. Now, vault is basically nothing but the space between the uh, posterior surface of the ICL and the anterior surface of the lens. The ideal vault uh, range should be between 250 to 750 microns, which is about half to one and a half corneal thickness. So, so surgery normally is done under uh, topical anesthesia. Initial stages, uh, what you can do is initially try to load the lens uh, before you shift the patient into the OR because loading the lens it might itself might take about 5 to 10 minutes. Uh, take a side port, inject viscoelastic, don't inject uh, too much of viscoelastic, don't overfill the AC with visco. Uh, uh, take a 2.8 millimeter keratome, but initial stages at least extend the incision to 3 to 3.2 millimeters so that you're easily you're, uh, pushing in the ICL into the AC. 
Once the ICL is in the AC, all you need to do is tuck in the ICLs and then you can do visco wash. Visco wash normally I prefer a bilateral uh, irrigation aspiration because uh, you can do a thorough visco wash with that. And then you can inject some pilocarpin and uh, hydrate the wound. So this is what the lens uh, design looks like in the ICL. The ICL basically has a body and uh, it has a uh, haptics. So basically we have the three uh, holes here in the center which is about 360 microns each. This hole basically allows a more natural aqueous flow and it also eliminates the need for any uh, peripheral hydrotomies. And as you can see the foot plates, you can see there are two holes in the foot plates. This basically gives you a proper orientation of the lens inside the eye. In case of a toric ICL you see these two lines which is uh, similar to something like your uh, intraocular lens. Uh, toric ICL basically looks like this. Uh, we have the lines which basically gives you the alignment marking and then uh, that uh, basically the lens comes with a chart. So uh, the line basically tells you and the chart gives you the idea of which axis and where it needs to be rotated. ICL normally the rotation is not more than 10 to 20 degrees and because the lens is extremely soft the rotation also is quite easy. So again coming to the central port of the ICL, now the aqueous flow through the central port, the advantage is it basically el eliminates the need for any uh, peripheral hydrotomies. It gives you a more uh, natural aqueous flow, there's no chance, there's not, uh, there's a very uh, less chance of I IOP uh, spike post-operatively. Also if there's any viscoelastic that is trapped underneath the ICL, basically between the ICL and the lens, it's very easy to remove the uh, viscoelastic and also more importantly it eliminates the requirement of any peripheral hydrotomies. So post-operative regimen is just like any other cataract surgery, you start the patient on steroids and antibiotics. Post-operatively, do look for your vision, the intraocular pressure, the AR ratings, uh, look for the wall size. Like I said, the wall size normally is between half to one and a half corneal thickness. Look for any signs of uh, inflammation. And other eye, once you see the patient on post-operative day one, when the eye is quiet and all the parameters are okay, then you can plan the other eye on day three. So how to start? Uh, basically, luckily, ICL does not require crores and crores of investments. We don't need to buy a LASIK suite. All you require is a uh, cataract uh, OT. And initial stages, the uh, ICL team is there to help you and assist you till you become independent and learn to do your surgeries on your own. The lens is extremely soft. It is very easy on the lens. Even if it does touch the lens capsule, it does not easily rupture the lens capsule. And uh, worst case scenarios, initially, we might be worried about the lens flipping or opening on the other side. Even if it does flip, the lens can be easily removed and re in the same sitting, you don't really have to postpone the surgery. And ICL is reversible surgery. So finally, uh, tips, uh, basically initial stages uh, or even I still do it, uh, I load the lens before shifting the patient into the OR. Loading takes some time, so uh, be slow, uh, be gentle and remember there is very less space in the uh, fakey eye, so be extremely soft with the lens and um, initial stages make a very large incision so it's easy for you to uh, put the lens inside. Even if you have to take a suture, at least make 3 to 3.2 millimeter incision. A proper visco wash is very important. Normally I use a bimanual irrigation aspiration and I normally ask my assistant to look for at least one minute. I do a one minute thorough visco wash, uh, visco underneath the ICL and visco at the angles have to be removed. Uh, don't immediately discharge the patient, uh, make the patient wait uh, outside, wait for at least a couple of hours, look for your slit lamp findings, check, check your intraocular pressure and then discharge the patient. And post-operative day one when the eye is quiet and everything is okay, then you can plan the other eye. Thank you. Um, thank you Dr. Rabat for such a nice overview. Just one thing that uh, any role of uh, UBM preoperatively, you do or you don't? No, we're not doing right. Because we have seen two, three patients where we have found the iris cyst. No, right now we're not doing any UBM. So. Mal can comment. Yeah, so I, yeah, I've also seen a couple of patients with iris cyst preoperatively because we do a UBM regularly to try and match the sulcus to sulcus diameters. And uh, the iris cysts were what precluded the use of an ICL in those patients. So it it's not a very common occurrence, but it's something that we have to keep an eye on. Uh, very nicely covered. Uh, just a couple of points I want to make is when you do the, you did say that uh, you can use IOL master also, but uh, that measures sclera to sclera, while you want mid limbus to mid limbus. So generally it gives about 0.4 to 0.5 millimeters more. So I think that will be covered during sizing. Other thing among indications you mentioned, keratoconus and ectatic disorders. Extremely important that uh, you make sure it's a centered cone and correctable with glasses. If supposing the patient needs a um, row scale lens or a sterile contact lens for the correction of the refractive error, that patient is definitely not a good candidate for uh, uh, putting in a fake intraocular lens because uh, that cylinder, that's an irregular uh, astigmatism and that will not be taken care of by this. So I would uh, qualify my indication for keratoconus by saying that if it can, if it's stable and correctable by glasses, then you can go ahead with the toric faking. Otherwise, I think everything was covered. And I, I, I was just not uh, 
convinced about why you need to call patients after three or four hours after the surgery? No, I don't call the patients. Ah. I keep the patient for two hours. Okay. And then I check the IOP and then I send them. Okay, okay. But I think um, when you're doing the aspiration, if your um, aspiration port is very close to the center flow and you keep it there for some time, then that ideally would clear out all the HPMC that's in the AC and Dimox post-operatively would help. I don't think that, uh, I, at least for the several years that we've been doing, in the beginning we would have this fear that the pressure would be elevated. But then over time you realize that with a certain amount of duration of time spent in the AC, like you said, a minute or whatever it is, that chance of having a raise in intraocular pressure is much, much less. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good so there's a risk of IOP rise, so which visco we should use, HPMC or? So I've always been using HPMC, uh, but there are people who do use sodium hyaluronate. I think it's a little risky because you can't actually go underneath the I ICL to aspirate. So that's something that you can't do. Unlike cataract surgery, it's very tempting to tap on an ICL. You should not do that. And obviously you cannot go underneath it and aspirate. That will cause damage to the lens. What do you sure. use? I was using HPMC and that was what was recommended for a long time. Last couple of years, we have completely shifted on to Elon, simply because we don't give, go into the irrigation aspiration canal at all. Once the ICL is placed and positioned, uh, whether it's IPCL or ICL, then just uh, irrigating the side ports in the main incision itself, the entire uh, visco comes just comes out as a bolus. So I find that, you know, once that uh, string start, uh, uh, the bolus stops coming, you know that it's completely empty. So the, um, the, what happens is, doesn't it get cleaved when you're putting it and some remains trapped underneath the ICL? Uh, so do you use some fluid and kind of divert it out? The, it comes out as a one mass. Okay. And once I see clear fluid coming out of the side ports and main incision, mm. I know that's the end of uh, surgery. So I don't even use the irrigation aspiration cannula now. Just the uh, oh, hilon yeah. So next I invite Dr. B. Ramesh Babu. Uh, his topic is challenges in ICL sizing. I think the most challenging task. Yeah, good morning. Good morning everyone. I thank AOS and uh, chair and co-chair for giving me this uh, opportunity. I'll be talking on challenges in ICL sizing. I'll be discussing two cases where I have faced problems. I don't have any financial disclosures. Coming to case one, 23 year female came for refract surgery. She had a uh, spectacle power of minus uh, 10 with 0.75 cylinder in the right eye, 9 with 0.75 in the left eye. And we have noticed some, yeah, otherwise uh, uh, anterior chamber and posterior chambers are, uh, uh, post anterior segment, posterior segments are normal. And we have noted few anterior subcapsular opacities in the right eye in the lens. Otherwise, everything in both eyes was normal. Coming to op scan report, it showed uh, it showed uh, pompous keratoconus, and Sarah also confirmed the same thing. Pompous keratoconus. So we have done. We decided to go ahead with ICL in this case. We have, we have always uh, we have the habit of uh, using three instruments: op scan, Cyrus, and digital caliper. These are the white to whites uh, and anterior chamber depth. So, among the all available sizes, we decided to go ahead with 13.2 uh, mm ICL. This was a technique of ICL. First main port uh, is made, 3.2 mm. Then a side port. I, I have a habit of making only one port, and ICL is loaded. Then it's view kicks forceps, it's being loaded onto the cartridge. So we'll be pulling the cartridge over the ICL and the lens is now being implanted. First into the sulcus, then into the, first into the, yeah, first behind the iris, uh, sorry, be, before the iris, then we'll be uh, tucking the foot plates behind the iris. I have the habit of uh, first irrigating the uh, irrigating the behind the ICL through the centre hole. Then afterwards, I will be putting the aspiration port near to the centre hole. This is the surgery. It was done. So this was the sticker. Our next day, post of vision was six nine, but 
there was a low wall superiorly and posterior surface of the icl is touching anterior capsule of crystalline lens subluxed icl and inferior temporally so that icl border is visible and central hole was covered by iris and iop was 16 mm so this is actually undersized icl so we de decided to exchange exchange the icl with the little more size of icl that is we will be implanting 13.7 in this case this how it's being done when we placed the icl horizontally it shifted vertically we have noticed first we have brought the icl about the iris and one foot plate was uh, grasped and what pulled out entire lens can come out so this exchange was done comfortably so then afterwards everything was normal post operatively patient was good doing well coming to the case 2 female 21 years so she had refractive power a power of uh, refractive error of minus 9 spherical in the right eye and minus 0.5 with minus 1 in the sp uh, cylinder in the left eye otherwise anterior segment and posterior segments are within normal limits coming to op scan report it was uh, normal except for the minus 9 the thickness may not be option for uh, laser vision correction side is also the same thing so we decided to uh, go with right eye icl and left eye trans prk these are the white to white measurements and anterior chamber depth measurements left eye we have done trans prk depending on the readings we have decided decided to go ahead with 13.2 mm lens so anyway i need not show this uh, implantation video post op vision was good the problem is little increasing the even with the dimax pressure was 20 to uh, 20 mm of uh, hg and the patient was last last to follow up because of pain although we are calling patient was uh, not lifting the phone and people was horizontally oval when we uh, seen her 3 days after 3 three, three days high we have seen high wall superiorly iris showed some amount of atrophic patches even though patient was on dimax pressure was on high higher side 28 28 mm of mercury so we thought of rotating the icl vertically so that uh, size, size may be sufficient for this one to reduce the uh, vault it was done even then uh, to the satisfaction the problem was not not resolved so ultimately we decided to exchange the video this is the explantation again we are doing the similar manner no need to, uh, so it's the same thing done no? but the because there was atrophic pavel people was not reacting optimally especially in the temporally temporally and superiorly so we decided to go with the single pass for through pupilloplasty even after exchanging the uh, lens this was uh, uh, this how it's being done we are uh, following the same uh, uh, amar agarwal's uh, technique in the similar manner to get the pupil round S uh, round and small to decrease the glare uh, of the patient four thrusts are being made then then suture is pulled uh, on the both sides to get uh, small people this this is not we thought this is not sufficient and one or more also made to get a satisfactory result so this was the size this was, we have undersized the length to 12.6 so estimation of the sulc ideal ideal thing is we need to measure sulcus to sulcus for icl placement but we are measuring white to white as a surrogate measure there is a study by uh, chen uh, chen chen et al which was published in 2021 there in the extremes of uh, the white to white that's 11.08 to 12.5 it becomes unpredictable that's what they are saying 
but in our case although it's within uh, that range only we faced problems one is undersized one is oversized so we need to be very careful we need to aware aware of this problem so that concludes my presentation any thoughts any thoughts how to overcome it huh like how to overcome this problem. issue that is a problem so ideal way is to measure sulcus to sulcus we can't we don't have proper instruments to measure sulcus Correct. to sulcus. ubm we can measure but it's not accurate but th but these are unusual cases right where you have a 11.4 and you land up putting 13.7 finally yes. and then you have the second one was 12. Point, uh, yeah 12 12.1 and 12.2 and you had to downsize it to 13.2 so that's very unusual. So maybe I think maybe a UBM or first something. Case, first case I have done six months back and the second case I have done one year back. I, I no. can't think of an <coughs> explanation uh, why it yeah. happened. No, one thing is, you know, UBM is uh, though intuitively it would be the right way to go because the ICL goes into the sulcus. Mm. It's exactly you don't have a specific area from where to measure. That is so, problem. you know, yeah, you yeah. same UBM surgeon is asked to measure, they give different variations. And all the sizing of lenses by Star as well as other companies is based upon the white to white measurement rather than the uh, sulcus to sulcus measurement. And uh, you mentioned during your talk that uh, we decided to go. You send the measurements to the company and they tell you the measurement or you decide? Sir, uh, we decide. We actually. We, we send the data, sir. We have, we do ourselves also, no, we send because, the data. No, we, I think it's better to send the data to them yeah, yeah. and let them decide because you know, it's not, though white to white is the most important determinant. Most it of is, it most is also, of the, most it of is them also, decides. it is also important that to know that uh, whatever we are saying, the, it's about one millimeter more than the white to white applies to eyes where the AC depth is between three to 3.5 millimeters. Yeah. When it's less than three millimeters, you go one size down. And if it's more than 3.5 millimeters, you go one size up. In, and bo in also both cases, it was 3.1. Okay. No, I'm yes. just saying for completion. And then yes. you, keratometry as well as lens size also matters. These are the reasons why occasionally, in spite of doing everything right, you get a surprise like this. And I think you did the right thing by exchanging the lens. Yeah. But it's extremely rare. I mean, it's not that... Uh, yeah. So, so I think sometimes intraoperatively also you can, you know, you can judge that, okay, if the lens is moving around too freely, then yeah. you know it's like going to be flat. And if it's, uh, if you're not able to form the AC very well and you realize that there's iris coming to the port, then you know it's going to be, the vault is going to be higher. Though at that time you're not going to explain it and tell the patient, okay, sorry, I didn't put the lens. So then you have this dilemma because I, uh, Second you know, it's Second case, happened. while uh, tucking the hammer, there was a lot of difficulty. Hmm. So that yeah. that happens when it's when it's little on the larger side. Lower size, yeah. But then from the measurements that you showed, because OBSCAN is what the company recommends, yeah. the white to white diameter from OBSCAN, and you have that. It's not that we're looking at Pentacam versus digital caliper. It's not that, right? So you're looking at an OBSCAN value, which is what they recommend, and there you're going wrong. So I really don't know why that happened. Yeah. Might make sense to look at um, ACD again, whether there was something wrong in that ACD measurement, if there were some discrepancies. UBM, if there's something else that's behind there that's kind of causing the, you know, the difference in the walls, but I really cannot figure out why. No, very rarely you come yeah. across situations like this. But uh, the company nomogram takes care of all this, the, not just the white to white, but the AC depth as well as the uh, yes. keratometry readings. So, so the, I think the issues that we normally have are if you have, say, a white to white, which is 11.6, 11.7 or 12.6, 12.7. So there it could go either just way. Just a point one, just point, two. point one, point two, this way, that way. Then if you take, um, either you take say a 13.2 for a 12.6, that could be flat. And if you take 13.7, that could be a high volt. So that's where you have this dilemma. And then you have a discussion with them and then you toss a coin and decide, let's go to one. Yeah. And but again, you know, for the sake of completion, uh, limbus itself is not a line, but it's a zone. Yeah. And you are supposed to take from mid limbus to mid limbus. And that's the reason ideally you should take a, in, in the operating microscope with the speculum in place and seeing that and so you uh, take the spots in the middle yeah. of the gray zone then you are more accurate and as Dr. Merle said even a 0.1 or a 0.2 millimeters will shift your sizing by 0.5 millimeters so obviously that would make a difference. So ultimate uh, uh, the message is we can't blindly depend on white white. Uh, but we don't have an answer to that that's all <laughs> that's that we have right now. <laughs> okay thank you.
So I think the take home is that you do your uh, manual reading, digital reading, op scan and the IL master and send to the company and let them decide. And I think one other thing is that and we counsel. have only… Huh? And counsel the and patient. And counsel the patient there. Because I think the possibility of an ICL exchange is not very high. Um, so what I've been telling people is that, okay, one in hundred possibility yeah. that we might have to exchange yes. ICL and if you tell them that, then I think that the acceptance post-operatively, if you say it's a high vault or a low vault, ready, they'll say, okay, fine, unfortunately, I'm in that 0.1% or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important to tell them. Yes. Thank you, sir. So now next I invite Dr. D. Ramamurthy for his talk on continuous range of vision technology. Life begins at 33 centimeters. Over to you, sir. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, this is uh, intervening in between some talks on fake intraocular lenses and uh, this is a sponsored talk and I'm a consultant for J&J uh, um, &G and Alcon. And uh, the continuous range of vision in talk lenses uh, is an interesting addition to what the armamentarium that we have. And uh, today I find that whenever I prescribe glasses, whether it's to a 10-year-old or a 40-year-old getting his first pair of uh, presbyopic glasses, or a 62-year-old who has got a cataract with a PMMA lens done, there is a tinge of disappointment. <clears throat> I thought, <coughs> why me? Do I really need these glasses? So obviously the way to go, if you can uh, address this and give them glass-free, spectacle-free vision uh, at whatever age they present to us, that will be a great way to go. We have been doing multifocal intraocular lenses for a couple of decades now, but still the adapt adoption, the slowly the numbers are raising off late, but it's less than 20% in my own hands. The reasons is not just the cost alone, but the fact that we are unable to promise them continuous range of vision for near, intermediate and distance. That's what most of our patients demand. <coughs> Again, the uh, challenge is also that they want to see at hot lighting conditions, bright light, dim light, night vision conditions, etc. And obviously, the dysphotopsia is a problem which most of the multifocals, trifocals, even the EDOF lenses are, uh, come with. And that's the reason that the uptake of these lenses still remains uh, somewhat less than what we would desire. <clears throat> As we all know, the first uh, lenses that we are c comfortable with, the monofocal intraocular lenses, it's a no first lens where you find that, uh, okay, the pointer is not showing. Uh, where you can see that there is an excellent focus. The focus is where the grey area is. Excellent focus as far as the distance is concerned. Intermediate and near, obviously, you require glasses. Mm -hmm. Then came the bifocal, the diffractive bifocal lenses. And uh, there was good focus for distance, good for near. The initial lenses I used were the Technis 4 diopter lenses, add-on lenses. Excellent near vision that they used to give. And obviously, that was... Uh, but there was a significant area where the vision was not quite adequate. And uh, then the trifocal lenses, you, that you can see by the whitish area in between. And then the trifocal intraoc lenses where you had the distance vision, the intermediate vision and the near vision. But then as far as the intermediate vision, you had to choose between 60 centimeters and <coughs> 80 centimeters depending upon the optics of that particular lens. Again, there were some areas where the vision was not continuous. So the continuous range of vision lens or the <coughs> synergy, what it attempts to give you is a seamless uh, uh, visual vision across all distances from distance near and intermediate. And at least in my hands, I see that uh, bilaterally implanted, most of these patients function quite well from 33 centimeters to almost till infinity. Why is it called synergy? Because it's a uh, combination of two technologies. Uh, the first lens, as I mentioned, the multifocal lenses I was used to was the Technis Plus 4, then the 3.25, then the 2.5, and of course the Alcon platform lenses also. Excellent distance and uh, near vision, but uh, the near vision used to be at 25 centimeters, 33 centimeters, etc., depending on the add power of that lens. But then the dysphotopsia was somewhat unacceptable in dim light conditions, as well as there was a, a, a central area, the intermediate zone, the vision was not adequate. EDOF lenses came with a uh, was a compromise solution where the quality of vision was somewhat better, but then <coughs> for near vision you definitely needed glasses. So the synergy is essentially supposed to combine the virtues of two, both these technologies. And as you can see here, what uh, you see over here is that uh, uh, green line, what is shown in the green line is the ideal where we want an excellent visual equity for distance and all the way from uh, intermediate to near, you want the vision to be somewhere in 20, 30 or better. 
but uh, obviously when you go on to the uh, what's represented by the gray line the the edof lenses what you find is that there is a good good vision for distance and there is a reasonably good vision uh, 6 by 6 or 6 by 7.5 vision as far as intermediate vision is concerned but beyond 1.5 diopters of defocus there is a steep fall and that's the reason that you need readers when you come to bifocal intraocular lenses that's by the deep curve over here there is excellent vision for distance, ex good vision for uh, near, but then there is a, a central trough where in the intermediate area the vision is not so good. <clears throat> so what you have in this uh, second curve is what's for the synergy which is represented by the blue line, which almost mimics the ideal where there is a peak for the distance and a fairly good 20-30 vision maintained for near as well as intermediate. Of course, this is if you hit uh, emetropia and you have the choice of doing something to the other eye, so the second eye, so that bilateral implanted, these lenses work quite well. It's essentially, when I was initially in introduced to the concept of HL8 with the EDOF lenses, I thought this is unique to these lenses, but almost the monofocal lenses also have a HL8 pattern. And it's a proprietary diffractive design of the Synergy, which is optimized to deliver a full range of vision with a peak at distance and continuously distributed from distance to near, which enables these lenses to uh, function quite well for all distances. And this is, uh, it's the type of HLA that's incorporated in the EDOF lenses, in the trifocal lenses, in the CRV lenses, that determines the actual um, power or the actual uh, <coughs> defocus curve of these lenses. Then uh, again, the one thing which always used to bother us is the contrast loss. And whenever you split light, which all these multifocals or trifocal lenses do, do, there is a compromise as far as uh, contrast uh, is concerned. And as you can see over here, the MTF values are 3 millimeter pupil for all the uh, normal, uh, normally used lenses, whether it's a Synergy or the uh, uh, trifocal lenses, is almost similar. There's the Synergy scores a little better. When it comes to mesopic conditions, when the pupil dilates to 5 millimeters, as you can see, the MTF is almost twice as good as what you, um, what you find with the commonly used trifocals. There are reasons for that and I will shortly allude to it. And this is a very important uh, um, <coughs> optical quality slide. You might do well to understand this. And as you can see, even with the normal monofocal intraoc lenses, even with the normal optics of the eye, the MTF or the what is MTF, the modulation transfer function, is nothing but the ratio of the contrast between the object of regard and the image it produces. What is the drop in contrast that occurs when a ray of light passes through uh, an optical system? And as you can see, even with the monofocal intraoc lenses, there is a drop in the MTF values. With the multifocal intraoc lenses, the drop is significantly more. And what is shown in the darker areas over there is when the pupils are mesopic, when the pupils are mid-dilated, and you can see the MTF drop is significant in these cases. With the trifocal lenses, both the uh, MTF, both for the, uh, in the photopic and mesopic conditions, is almost half as much as uh, of what is mono, what you get in the monofocals. That's the reason that you have a significant drop in quality. But when you look at the EDOF lens, the symphony or the synergy, you can see that the drop in uh, quality of vision that occurs from the, uh, um, photopic to mesopic conditions is significantly less. And also, you can see that 0 0.40 here, the 0 0.40 here, and the, again, the, uh, in the mesopic conditions, it almost matches the quality of vision that you get with monofocal and troc lenses, and that's a significant advantage. And then you have the Coroman line uh, technology incorporated in this. What exactly in that? We have used to spherical aberration compensation for quite some time, where we have a minus 0.27 Q value on the lens, which compensates for the average uh, positive Q value in the average cornea. Chromatic aberration, again, all normal eyes have a positive chromatic aberration. And when you put in a, a conventional spherical lens, that also comes in with a spherical, uh, with a positive chromatic aberration. And because of which the amount of chromatic aberration that the patient has to deal with significantly increases <clears throat> almost up to two diopters. That is when green light is in focus on the fovea, the blue light gets focused in front and the red light behind the retina. So obviously this also causes a deterioration of vision. But uh, the chroma line te technology which is incorporated in the, you know, the symphony as well as the synergy has essentially a 
negative chromatic aberration and this to some extent uh, compensates the positive chromatic aberration of the normal human eye because of which the total amount of chromatic aberration apart from the spherical aberration is also reduced. <coughs> and this is the slide showing you the chromatic aberration. As you can see over here, both for the Technic Symphony, the uh, dotted line actually represents the chromatic aberration of the uh, fake eye. And when you implant some of the more common lenses, the multifocals as well as the trifocal lenses, essentially they increase the amount of chromatic aberration that is there in the eye. But with the Technic Symphony and the Technic Synergy, because they have negative chromatic aberration, you find that the chromatic aberration subsequent to the implantation of these lenses is reduced. So we all know this, this is, is uh, uh, Technic's platform of lenses have a minus 0.27 Q value on their lenses. And because of the uh, reduction in the chromatic aberration as well as spherical aberration, there is a synergistic effect. It's just, just not a simple add-on. And uh, because of this, the uh, quality of vision is significantly better with these lenses. And that is something that we have experienced. And uh, you can see this lens, the another important factor that's uh, incorporated in this is that it has this uh, specific uh, um, blocking of the blue light while it allows the uh, violet light, it blocks the violet light while it allows the blue light to pass through. When you talk about the conventional blue blockers, they block up to 480 microns. 400 to 440 is violet, 440 to 480 is blue light. The violet light, which has the lower wavelength, causes much of the scattered deterioration in the quality of vision. But the blue light is something which is good for mesopic vision, which is good for the quality of vision, has a role in circadian rhythm also. So by, by blocking the violet light, by allowing the blue light to pass through, the, uh, the good light is allowed to take part in the visual phenomenon, while the scatter by the violet light is something that's reduced. This is just a very short video. And <clears throat> Uh, it's now the implantation, the orientation of these lenses is very much like uh, what uh, we have with the conventional Technics lenses. It's a 6 millimeter, 13 uh, overall uh, optics, 13.5 millimeter overall uh, single piece hydrophobic acrylic implant, glistening free, and it has to be implanted in the back. It has uh, uh, full diffractive rings right uh, through, and because of which, even in mesopic conditions, the quality of vision is reasonably good. And uh, that's just the uh, implant which is being finished. And uh, basically the Synergy is supposed to give you a continuous range of vision from 33 centimeters to distance. It corrects spherical aberration as well as chromatic aberration, which contributes to the quality of vision. And because it's a 6 millimeter full optic lens, it's a pupil independent lens. And <clears throat> it uh, uh, blocks the ultraviolet and the violet light while uh, letting the blue light pass through. And you have the toric uh, platform also integrated in this so that you can take care of the cylinders. And it comes in the tried and tested Technics platform which we are used to for more than the last couple of decades. So basically today even the elderly want to live their life to the fullest. And uh, I think uh, these kind of lenses, it's not that I use only the Synergy lenses, but I'm a big fan of the multifocals as well as the toric lenses. And it's good to have choices and we choose the right patient and the right lens and match them together. The uh, results are quite amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for such an excellent talk. I think we are moving from now on this uh, trifocal to CRV because the, in the trifocal we are having a split. We are having three focus. Because of that, we are losing the contrast because when you have three focus, there is that losing of the contrast because uh, you are losing the light because I think 80 to 86 percent and in the CRV we have continuous so we are not losing the light amount of light in the CRV no, technology. Still, uh, <coughs> we have 88 percent light is replaced 12 percent here CRV also. also. So it's not as if synergy is without dysphotopsia. Okay. It does come but then it's little, supposed little to because better. of the chromaline technology and as you said yes. better light utilization yes, than 82 percent watts utilize the, the amount of dysphotopsia is sl slightly less. Okay. Dr. Man. So what is your choice of patient? Because I think that's very important. So which patient would you prefer to use, uh, say, a trifocal or a monofocal or a um, EDOF lens or the Synergy? So you know, how do you categorize them based on their functional and their vision needs? So supposing it's a patient who doesn't read, doesn't require much of uh, uh, reading vision, is quite happy with the monofocal, cost is also a constraint. And uh, definitely we go ahead with a monofocal intraoc lens. It's a no-first lens. But uh, in case the patient is concerned about uh, 
um, wants to read and wants to do everything without the need for glasses, then trifocals or the continuous range of vision lenses is the way to go. We use both the Synergy as well as the Panoptics and quite a few Indian trifocals also in good numbers. And uh, uh, we find that as far as the choice of patients, the counselling is right. The results are quite satisfactory. But if the patient is somebody who says he's in his 60s or 50s, but says every day I have to ride, drive back home for 8 kilometers, uh, and that's it, driving vision is extremely important because you're never able to predict who are the patients who are going to uh, have this dysphotopsia. Then we would counsel these patients, and some of them still choose to go ahead. They say that I'll manage, I'll let me uh, 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 see if it works for me. And surprisingly, it, uh, many of them do well. Unfortunately, for all of us, we only remember that occasional patient who takes a lot of chat time and complaints. But there are many of them getting routine surgery done and going away quite happy. And as far as you take care of the cylinders also appropriately, with a, then the results are quite good. The EDOF lenses, I feel that whether it's the monofocal plus lenses, the EDOF lenses, is something is a compromise both as far as the quality of vision and the quantity of vision is concerned. We always tell them that you would need readers. And in case you have talked to them uh, about they are interested in multifocality but then get put off by dysphotopsia, you say, okay, this is a compromise solution. Go ahead with this monofocal plus. I think uh, you have the eye hands, you have the ever legs and other lenses. These are okay. They give a, about a 0.5 to 1 diopter as far as intermediate vision is concerned. But for uh, reading, you require 1.5. And so do you have, uh, what is your experience with mixing and matching uh, lenses? Actually, I used to do it all the time. Usually, yeah. uh, was allowing two weeks gap between the two eyes. It was not just the uh, shift in the uh, spherical power of the lens, but also even the type of lens implanted. We have quite a few patients who received symphony when it was very, uh, very much in practice. And now when they are coming for the second eye, we are putting in a trifocal okay. because that was not quite adequate for... Uh, and it works. I mean, there's nothing this lens did. This lens doesn't work with the other lens. But what I find with the CRV lenses as well as the panoptics lenses, if you hit emetropia, the need for mixing and matching has significantly come down. It used to be much more in demand when you had only the bifocal lenses with a plus 4 or a plus 2.5 eye, or when you had the EDOF lenses like the Symphony. But with the panoptics, the Indian triphobic, the Synergy, I think uh, the, re the need for, that need for it has come down. Yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, can we put one eye monofocal and other eye trifocal? Yeah, I mean, uh, no, uh, we do come across these patients, you know, where the one eye has already been operated years back. You might have yourself done the surgery. And now because their friends and relatives are having this, they come. You tell them this is not ideal, but then I have implanted quite a few. And these patients uh, are able to function reasonably well. Any question from the audience? Any doubts? For sir. Okay, so we have uh, now on the last speaker, Dr. Pragya Panda. She will be speaking on press biopia. Respected dignitaries and delegates. I uh, will be discussing about a physiological condition, press biopia. It's not moving. Uh, so, emetropia can be defined as a state of refraction when parallel rays of light coming from infinity are focused at the sensitive layer of the retina with the accommodation at rest. Now, if the light rays come close, they usually go diverge and requires more refraction for focusing. So, the mechanism by which the converging power of the eye is increased in order to uh, focus the diverging rays coming from the near object of the retina in a bit to see clearly is accommodation. So what are the various ways in which accommodation can be brought out? Um, theoretically, the eyeball can be lengthened or the cornea can be more curved or the lens can be moved, all these factors are not possible human being and only factor which is left is the 
change in curvature of the anterior surface of the lens. So the word presbyopia comes from the Greek, uh, Greek word presbyops, old man or elder, and the suffix opia means sightedness. Gradual age-related loss in the accommodative ability of the eye leading to progressive fall in near vision. There are various theories. Uh, so Helmholtz, Helmholtz theory in which uh, in the accommodated, unaccommodated state, the lens is compressed by the capsules, by the tension, by the genules, and contraction of the ciliary muscle causes the ciliary ring to shorten and move forward. Thus, the genules relax, and the capsular tension is relieved, and the lens attains a more spherical shape. A steering theory of increased tension, increased curvature of the capsule is due to increased tension on the zonules and contraction of the ciliary muscle pulls on the zonules directly and increases the tension on the capsule. This causes compression at the equator and bulging at the poles. All evidences, the anatomical and physiological are against this law. Now the Shaka's theory states the anterior and posterior zonules act like supporting uh, ligaments of a joint while relaxed during accommodation. The equatorial zonules contract while the ciliary muscle contracts and presbyopia develops due to increase in the equatorial diameter of the lens which in turn decreases the perilenticular space and ciliary spasm can no longer tense the zonules which is supported by scleral expansion band surgery. So my uh, the variation of accommodation with age occurs early in the life. Accommodation is 14 diopters and the near point is 7 cm. Around 36 years, it is 7 diopters and the near point is 14 cm. And around 40 years, it is 4 diopters and the near point is uh, 25 cm. Around 60 years, it comes to 1 diopter. So this is how the accommodation changes with age. Uh, near work is usually around 28 to 30 centimeter away from the eye. So the actual limit of near vision is reached around 40 years. It is not that at 40 years the changes occur. It occurs starting from the uh, very early age. But we manage to do our works within this distance of 30 centimeter. That is why the uh, presbyopia changes around for, uh, occurs around 40 years. Age related changes in the lens which occurs a decrease in the elasticity of the lens capsule and sclerosis of the lens substance. And age related decline in the ciliary muscle power. Difficulty occurs in near vision. Initially starts with dim light when the pupil is dilated allowing uh, large diffusion circles and there are <coughs> asthenopic symptoms due to fatigue of the ciliary muscles working at its maximum limit. So these are the various tests and accommodation assessment can be done by the RF rule. Uh, so what are the basic principles of presbyopic correction? Always find out the refractive error at, uh, for the distance and then correct it. Found out the presbyopic correction needed in each eye separately and add it to the distance correction. Presbyopic add prescription should leave one third of the accommodation in reserve to act uh, to have a comfortable near vision and the near point should be fixed by taking due consideration of the profession of the patient and weakest convex lens which uh, with which the individual can see clearly and comfortably at the near point should be given so presbyopia is a relative term as i always uh, told before so these are the symptoms uh, so what are the treatment options? The optical correction can be given uh, convex lenses. One third of the accommodation, as I told, it can be kept preserved. Better to under correct an intermediate distance wherever uh, required is to be given. Single uh, vision reading spectacles for near, double vision for near and distance, trifocals for intermediate and also progressive lenses. So these are the various types of uh, lenses can be given and contact lens can also be given for presbyopia. Monovision contact lens can be uh, a good uh, option. Modified monovision contact lens, bifocal uh, contact lens can be given. So one eye corrected for distance and the other eye for near. The disadvantage is the lack of binocularity and depth perception. Modified monovision, uh, one eye is corrected for distant vision and other eye bifocal contact lens. Advantage is binocularity for distant vision will be there. And uh, non-accommodative treatment, so one of the uh, monovision treatment can be done. Um, so what are the surgical procedures? 
the surgical procedure is very nicely described by my previous speakers. So, conductive keratoplasty uh, uses radio frequency waves to uh, heat the peripheral corneal collagen, which results in shrinkage of the peripheral and paracentral collagen, flattening of the peripheral cornea, done and stiffening of the central cornea. Usually uh, used after 40 years correction, one to uh, four diopters of connection. So, these are the various surgeries very nicely explained by my previous uh, speakers. So, uh, radio frequency energy is used uh, to gently heat and shrink the corneal collagen at specific treatment points to create a band of tightening. This band reshapes and steepens the cornea to correct hypermetropia and presbypia. So, these are the various spots which can be given. Uh, at which the radio frequency waves can be uh, given and these are the equipments which are needed. So, these things are very nicely uh, explained by my previous speakers. Accommodative files very nicely given by you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you ma'am for the excellent talk. Any comments, questions? Dr. Sorry. Ask the panel uh, about their experience on clear lens extraction for breast biopia. Yes, I do that now in the sense that uh, um, earlier it was considered to be uh, sacrilege to take out a clear lens. Uh, nowadays we have patients in their 50s coming to us with a plus 2.5 doctors, plus 3 doctor power and uh, they need 5.5 for distance. With the quality of uh, multifocal lenses that are available to us and uh, trifocal lenses and uh, our uh, experience with biometry, we go ahead and take care of these patients. Definitely, I would not do that for uh, uh, high myopia. Uh, definitely, it's not because of the significant retinal complications that is there. But uh, up to 40, it's laser vision correction. 40 to 50, it's, uh, I use uh, presbyopic fake intraoc lenses. And beyond 50, if it's a hyperopic patient, we do clear lens extraction if the patient comes asking for it. It's not that yeah, if we come for glasses and plus two, we don't uh, go ahead and counsel them for uh, clear lens extraction. Often sometimes the son gets a, a smile procedure, then the mother in the post of what about me, can you do something for me? And if she's wearing a 2, 2.5, uh, the results are good. But uh, clear lens extraction is something of a challenge both to the lens and the surgeon because the patients are coming with good quality vision and good quantity of vision. So, you have to be very thorough with your workup, look at the corneal abrasions, do an eye trace, topography, accurate biometry, but then bilaterally implanted, uh, many of these patients are quite happy. I think uh, maybe women might be more accepting of it than men. That's true, yeah. that's true. Yeah, because, you know, the, uh, especially in our society, still the night vision uh, driving uh, requirements for yeah. Sai, I have a question for you. <laughs> yeah, if, if all other parameters are normal, what is the, uh, if the cornea is also suitable for all the procedures, which is the, uh, if you, if the refractive power is, uh, suppose think eight, or nine, minus eight or minus nine. And which procedure you choose, ICL or a laser vision correction? I think that's a very important, relevant question. I mean, obviously, if there are any contraindications to uh, uh, what a laser vision correction, you'll go for a fake intraoc lens, whether it's a corneal curvature or topographic features or thickness. But then even uh, assuming that the patient absolutely ideal candidate, uh, minus eight, I would still go for a fake intraoc lens. You know, we have been doing laser vision correction for almost two and a half decades now. And I have started believing that uh, laser vision correction that we do has a lifetime. In the sense, 
even though patients have lived with a good vision for uh, 10 years, 12 years, they've ultimately come with a minus one, especially these high myopic eyes, a minus one, 1 1.5 diopters. Fortunately, by that time, we are almost approaching 40 because of which they are more accepting of that. But uh, if a patient is highly demanding, has a minus eight diopters, cost is not a constraint, then uh, fake intraocular lenses maybe gives us more repeatable, longer lasting results than a laser vision correction, whether it's smile or whether it's uh, uh, PRK or anything. I think the quality of vision with an ICL is much better than following a laser refractive surgery. So that becomes a plus point. You don't have to weigh how much of ablation you're doing. And, um, you know, the usually, so we have, uh, you know, surgeons in LBP who even do minus 12 laser ablations. But um, I have a cutoff and I think minus 8, maybe with a little bit of cylinder would be mine. I don't like to ablate more than 120 microns. And so I think the ICLs definitely, they give that edge. I know if you have regression, you can't do anything after that. So then um, you can obviously put an ICL for a regression and you have minus one or minus two adapters, you have to wear lenses, glasses or contact lenses. So I think that's a trade-off that you have to kind of deal with and, and the ICLs do well in that bracket of patients. You can always do a touch-up with a touch laser for an ICL, but uh, you can't do anything if you've done laser already. And since the course is a factor in India, not everyone can afford ICL. So, as the patients who are high myopes, not suitable for laser vision correction, you give the option of uh, fake IELTS versus the refractive lens exchange. Because the refractive lens exchange is that, uh, definitely cheaper than the ICL. Because the two IPCL or ICL goes up to 1.5 lakh and two refractive lens exchange. And you explain the complication of I I the refractive lens exchange and the ICL, and then definitely choose the refractive lens exchange only, that undersizing, oversizing. So, what we should do? But I think if you weigh the, the fact that you do a refractive lens exchange in a young patient, um, okay, you may get away by putting an, you know, an, a, a, a lens which is a trifocal or you know, one of the uh, CRV lenses, but you can't actually do that because of the retinal detachment yeah, risk yes. that they run, right? Yes. I mean, if somebody comes with a much higher, a much older age group, you may consider a refractive lens exchange, but even then for myopes, it's a little risky, I think. Yeah, vision with accommodation and without accommodation is totally different. That we need to understand. No lens, no artificial lens can match the natural lens. That company also accept and they, at most they are matching to a aged lens, not a young crystalline lens. But always with clear lens ex exchange, definitely you will carry all this, Madam has mentioned, no? Yeah, retinal detachment, special high myopes, retinal detachment, uh, CME, all these are possibilities. End of is, of course, it's rare, but it can happen. Then that's a problem. And if you explain them clearly, even they, if if they ready, then they agree, then only you can proceed. Well, like we have, uh, I have like four or five patients, like they came for laser, uh, laser vision correction because they don't know that it is up to, up for up to eight or nine. So they have minus 15, 20 power. They came, they want a lens, uh, laser surgery, then I told them you is, the surgery is not possible for you. Then they tell what are the other options. So we have ICL or refractive lens exchange. So they don't want to pay more than 50,000, but they want surgery. So they definitely ICL is out of question and trifocal are also out of question. Now you have monofocal or you do ICL. ICL they don't want, they, don't, they can't pay. So whether you will go for the refractive lens exchange or you defer the surgery. De defer, don't do it. I mean, yeah. I I think, you know, refractive lens exchange for a high myopia and a young patient yeah. is immediately gratifying, but in the long, long term can be disastrous. Yes. So the only place where you could consider it is in a middle-aged patient where there's a complete PVD. Oh. Because once that is there, the chances of a serious uh, retinal complication is somewhat diminished, yeah. not that it is done away. So mm -hmm. definitely uh, it's not an option. And when I was talking to that gentleman's uh, question about the fact that I was talking about high probes in the fifth, uh, fifth and sixth decade and he correctly put it that you can never match the natural lens with its accommodative capability. Yep. So a minus 8 or a minus 10 or even a minus 15 uh, coming for uh, at his 30 years or 20s coming for I think you should just uh, it's not an option stick to contact lenses or glasses. glasses. Yeah. Sir, I think uh, one point. I think the Indian companies like Biotech, the lenses are actually, the cost comes down to almost the cost of the femtolasic. So in such patients, you can consider the Indian uh, company uh, lenses yeah. for the same. Uh, so the cost RIL or uh, IPCL or the Biotech Acryl Fake with excellent quality of vision and the results are equal on par with the star ICL. 
So the cost also both ways it comes down to almost and that uh, the cost also it's like based on the power if it's min less than minus 8 is even more cheaper. So in such patients we can consider uh, Indian uh, fakie cleanses. Yeah. A very important point you know like everything else Indian whether it's Indian uh, fakie intraocular lenses, Indian yeah. intraocular lenses the quality is definitely improving yeah. Yeah. and we have no hesitation in recommending okay. those lenses yeah. to yeah. our patients. Yeah. Almost 50% of my patients get uh, Indian lenses with good results. Sir, one doubt I have. So, when you are counselling the patients for the uh, fakey cleanses, uh, how does your counsellor do it? Like, do you give an option of saying Indian or imported or you say uh, Biotech and Star or how do you counsel the patients? We never take the company's name. Okay. It's just that uh, two quality of lenses, like, it's very much like how we counsel for India, uh, intraocular lenses. Yeah. Say these two options are there. We are quite comfortable implanting the Indian lenses also. We are using it five, six years and almost 50% of the patients get it. But uh, if you want the very best, this is the lens with a, a three decade history, they are the originals. Yeah. And if cost is not a constraint, go for the uh, ICL, otherwise you won't be doing a mistake by going for these uh, Indian lenses. And uh, just like they offer Indian or imported intraocular lenses, they offer this. Yeah. And we are quite happy doing both. Yeah. Thank you. I have done all the all these lenses. Results are good, but the problem is with the material. I'm little skeptical about the material, hydrophilic material. Right? But the these, especially biotech lens and aposome lenses, are little thicker. And ivocare lenses is very thin. That's okay. But the problem is with the material. <coughs> so we don't know. We still we, res, res, results are definitely better. They are equally good, but we need to see the long term things. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. So we conclude the session here.